I am really, really excited to be here because River Trail Middle School is kind of famous in California and Africa. Uh, I am the founder of the African Library Project. We start small libraries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And River Trail Middle School, those that came before you, the alumni, have helped start, guess how many libraries in Africa? 20. 20. 20 above that. 27. That is more libraries than any other middle school in the United States. <laughs> so I want to just tell you a little bit of our story today and uh, see what you think. Go ahead. Um, once upon a time, my family took a trip to Africa. We went to a little teeny tiny country called Lesotho. Go ahead. In, southern, in the south of Africa, it's this tiny little country. It's a mountainous kingdom run by a king. Uh, and in the interior part of the country, there are no roads, there's no electricity, there's no running water, and there are certainly no books. Uh, in fact, in this country, it has the third highest HIV infection rate in the world. You ever heard of HIV? Yeah. Yes. A, a disease that you can get and it destroys your autoimmune system and unless you take very good care of yourself and also get some drugs, most people end up getting AIDS and they will die. Uh, in fact, there, it's so bad that you would have the average chance of living until you're 36 years old. So, how, are, how many of you have parents that are over 36 years old? Okay, it's not what you have. Things might affect your life a little bit. Okay. Almost half of the people there live on less than $1.25 a day. So, how much is a school lunch here? Two dollars. Three dollars. So you couldn't afford a school lunch here, right? Uh, in fact, that would be for your family, half a lunch for the day. Okay? Uh, this is the kind of house where most people live. It's called a Rome Duval. This is a very nice one. And the people live in these, um, uh, they wear blankets. That's their national dress. These are Basutu people in Lesotho. They speak Sasutu. One Basutu is called a Lesotho. <laughs> so we got a Lesotho of the Basutu who speaks Sasutu in Lesotho. We saw lots of kids on our trip that were also on horseback because that's the only way you get around besides walking in this area in Lesotho. And they have a bag of grain there. They're helping transport their family's goods from one town or, or village to another village. Or, most of them are actually shepherds. And they are taking care of their family's sheep or goats. And that's what most kids uh, do as children. Um, they have like, a family will have five or six sheep or goats, and that's how they have their family's wealth, is in their animals. So, um, a lot of kids cannot go to school. And you'll eat, you often see kids up to like 25, 30 years age. They're not really kids then, but 25 or 30 years old trying in, in high schools because they haven't had enough time to go when they were uh, like your age and they're trying to catch up. Um, very common. Here's a kitchen. They're cooking dinner. Playing. These are the lunch ladies on their way to school with lunch. Here's lunch. This may not look like much to us, a bunch of beans for lunch. That's what they had every day, the same lunch. And it's the only meal that most of these kids got every day. My son, as we're noodling along on our horses, got bored reading his book. And his favorite thing to do was read. So he pulled out a book and he started to read. It made me think about libraries are Ask Our Guide. I said, what about libraries in Lesotho? And guess how many libraries there were in Lesotho? None. One in the capital city. I couldn't stop thinking about that. I'm riding my horse. I was thinking about all the books falling off our bookshelves. How many of you have a problem at home keeping enough bookshelves for your books? Yeah. We don't have 
many books. And, uh, and then I thought about our landfills. Our landfills are getting too full of books here. We're filling up with landfills, and that's a problem for us as well. So what to do? I went back to the village, and I talked to the village headman. And I said, you interested in a library? We've always wanted a library. We've always wanted a library. We don't know how to get books. I said, well, there's a lot more to the library than books. And I cut a deal with him. I said, if you can provide the space for the library, the bookshelves, staff for the library, and the library committee, I will find a way to get you books. So they had a Peace Corps volunteer coming. Do we know what a Peace Corps volunteer is? If you know, raise your hand. Okay. A Peace Corps volunteer is sort of like the peaceful equivalent of the U.S. military. You sign up to serve as a U.S. citizen. Most people are coming out of college, but some are older. You sign up to serve for two years in a developing country. Most Peace Corps volunteers serve as uh, teachers or agriculture specialists or in community health. And they had a Peace Corps volunteer that was coming to their village in a couple of months. And when she arrived, coincidentally, go ahead, she turned out to be a retired librarian. Oh, yeah! So, uh, together, Marianne Eisman and I started five libraries in the Leia Valley. This big valley in Misutu. And those were the first five of the now more than 1,000 libraries that we have started in the last seven years in Africa. We turn spaces like this into spaces like this. Yeah. Go ahead. We've done 1,165 libraries in 10 countries. Over, we've sent over 1.2 million books, and we serve 1.5 million readers in English in countries where English is the national language. Kids in Africa grow up speaking their tribal language, but when they start school, they start learning English because that's their national language that their government is running. And they have to take a very um, difficult test at the end of seventh grade to see if they will be accepted into secondary or high school. Are you guys studying for it? Uh, there are, all, there are, like for instance, in Ghana, there are over 12,000 primary schools, but only 500 secondary schools. So that's a lot of kids that are not going to get in. So this kind of education that we have here, it rocks. We have no idea, but it truly rocks. Yeah. Can you explain to us what the difference is between a primary and a secondary school, Ms. Bradshaw? Primary is what they call schools in um, Africa that are elementary, and secondary is a high school. Thank Thanks you. for the question. Okay. So we're starting and improving small libraries in sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan, you know, the Sahara Desert goes right across sort of the top of Africa, and above that, almost everybody is an Arab speaker, an Arab, they speak Arabic, and below it, they're speaking, they're, they're either speaking uh, as their national language, French, English, or Portuguese, because those are the countries that colonized them in Europe about 200 years ago. When they were colonized by these European countries, the European countries said, these are your new borders, this is your new language. That's how it Okay. So we've developed this system so that any American can start a library, or somebody that lives in southern Canada as well, can start a library in Africa by collecting a thousand gently used books and raising about $500 to cover the cost of shipping. The books are all from preschool to eighth grade, because even for teachers, they, their literacy level, the level at which they can read, drops out by eighth grade. So uh, that's why we only send it back to eighth grade books. Next, we're going to move on. I'm going to, I want to talk a little bit about Ghana, because I know you're studying Ghana this year, or you will be soon. This is Ghana, here in West Africa. And uh, this is called the Gold Coast in Africa. And the, uh, Ghana has a lot of gold, especially where the Ashanti people live. That's a tribal group, and you're going to be studying the Ashantis. Go ahead. This is our partner in Ghana, Ernest. And he has, he's got an Ashanti mask held up to his face. Uh, the Ashantis are matrilineal, which means that they pass all of their property down from the mother to the daughter. Most 
of the cultures in the world, there are very few matrilineal. Most of them are patrilineal, and things get passed to the father. Here, I don't know what you call what we are. Anybody know what we are? I don't know. We're not lineal. Is it you're good? My parents will give you boys and girls equal share. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Here's Ernest without his mask. He's actually not an Ashanti. He is a Brahmahapa, which is another tribal group. He's so happy in this because two days ago, our container arrived in Ghana with 60 libraries in it. And Ernest is the founder of the Michael Lapsley Foundation, a nonprofit, which they call NGOs in the rest of the world. Uh, a non-governmental organization is what they call nonprofits in the rest of the world. He really wanted to partner with us. I'm going to tell you a story of how he started. He called me every day for two months from Ghana and said, Hello, Chris, this is Ernest. I would really like to partner with you. And he told me, you know, what they were doing and how they could do it. And finally, I said, Ernest, it's great to talk to you. <coughs> Uh, we're not going to do, you know, I'm not even looking at, you know, partnerships for months. So then he started calling once a week, which was great. <laughs> anyway, a lot of perseverance. We could learn a lot from Ernest, honestly. Go ahead. So I thought I would take a couple years ago I was in Ghana, and I thought I'd take you on a little bit of uh, where I was in Ghana. This is the capital in Accra. There's two million people there. It's kind of a crazy, crazy city with massive amounts of traffic. Um, and all of the skys all of the cities in uh, capital cities in Africa have some skyscraper. That's the presidential palace, think White House of Ghana. Um, they do have a president. They have a democracy. They have uh, a parliament. And, go ahead. and these are the members. These two guys are members of parliament. And we have a special relationship in Ghana with the parliament because Ernest who's in the purple, found out that um, every member of parliament was given a chunk of change to help improve their local district. And so he would go to the members of parliament and say, together with the African Library Project and the Michael Lapsley Foundation, we can help start a library in your district, in your chunk of change. And they love that. And so that's what we're doing in Ghana. Most of the buildings look more like this. This is like a 7-Eleven of Ghana. It has a little bit of everything. Uh, or a little store like this. You see lots of people out in front of the stores. There's a lot of socializing. You see a whole lot more people in Africa because they're not in their cars. They're not in their houses. They're out talking to each other. They're very close as families. Okay. Uh, this is, in fact, could you go back just one for a second? I wanted to show you all of these pictures. This building in the background is actually a shipping container, like you see on the backs of trucks here. Um, and they put them in, in, on sea on ships that go out to sea, and a lot of the buildings in Africa, they've taken their shipping containers and cut holes out of them and put in windows and doors and made buildings. So go to the next one. Um, and actually they have a shipping container right here that they're using for this store too, where they're selling frozen foods at. Right. This is another kind of store that you see all over Africa. This is in Ghana, but it's a store on the top of your head where people buy things and then they resell them on the streets. And, uh, I mean, you'll see all kinds of crazy things on people's heads. Um, they have a lot of traffic, and they have so much traffic that the traffic is stopped normally. Like, it's like kind of 24-7 traffic jam. The vendors um, will walk in between the lanes of traffic, selling things to people. Uh, so what do you think happens if he, you know, you say, oh yeah, I want that yellow thing up there. Fans? Oh yeah, little fan. Yeah, portable fan. Okay, I want a little, I like that green portable fan. And he goes, okay, he gives you the green portable fan, but you haven't paid him the money yet. The traffic moves. What do you think happens? He does chase you. He runs like crazy, and there's a lot of people running in between the lanes of traffic. It's scary. It's very scary. Anyway, Medical uh, health care is a little dicey in Africa. Make that very dicey. Um, and uh, there's a lot of traditional healers, uh, some of who do some good things, some of who guarantee all kinds of things they can't really deliver. Like at the bottom it says 100% cure assurance for all of these things, everything from uh, fibroid diabetes, waist pains, gonorrhea, stomach ulcers, you know, asthma, 100% cure. 
So that is a problem that you see endemic pretty much throughout Africa, especially rural Africa, is trying to get good medical care. So uh, we went up country, which means any place outside of Accra, and to this little village, and I thought I'd take you on a walk. I got up early in the morning and went for a walk in this little village, and I saw this girl on her way to school, because all kids there wear school uniforms. She was very kind to let me walk with her. Go ahead. And we talked about it. She had already gotten up at 5 a.m., and she had fetched the water and went to the well and fetched the water for her family, brought it back on top of her head, and then... Uh, she helped her mother make breakfast and swept out the compound, and now she's on her way to school. And this was all, this was about 7 a.m. Um, go ahead. So along the way, we saw women in their kitchens uh, making food, and uh, we also um, I, and there's no daycare in Africa, but your neighbors, your family, other family members will take care of it. And, Children are so precious to Africans. It's mostly because most African women have lost at least one child to in childbirth or to a disease when they're very young. The mortality rate is the, when you're going to die is it's very high for children. I just liked her, so I threw her picture in. But she was on the lawn. Um, this is they're doing laundry, and I want you to just notice this little child right here. This is where they're playing. This is dirty water that has been flowing through. They've been using it to wash in, and who knows what is in that water. But clean water is another huge issue in Africa. And um, and also, like, notice there's no trees or anything like that. Environmental degradation or taking down, like, the trees and not replanting them and not having that. that when you do that, then you get gullies like this where things wash when they're not plants to root in the ground. That's another huge problem in Africa. Go ahead. This is the school's um, soccer field. Do you guys have a soccer field? Yeah. Is this what yours looks like? Yeah. <laughs> okay. We arrived at school. The good thing about this school is it had a roof. Uh, and it had a tin roof. So when it rained, if it wasn't raining, there's no wind, it would keep you dry. They get the same kind of rains there that you get here. They just go, like yesterday, boom. It's raining really hard. Um, a lot of schools are like this. Go ahead. She was a little shy or embarrassed maybe to have me in her class with her. But the kids liked it. <laughs> and the teachers liked it. Um, the teachers there are just, they don't have books available. This is not one of our schools where we put a library. This was just, I followed her to school. And um, so they're teaching from memory. And they also learned from teachers who were teaching from memory, which makes the amount that you can teach extremely well, limited. Uh, go ahead. So then we took off later and we were visiting schools where we do have libraries. And this was one of those schools. You'll notice all the kids have... Uh, uniforms, and this teacher is from Brongahafo. This is their national dress, in the, for, or, or the tribal dress for Brongahafo, what he's wearing. He's actually really dressed up, and I love their pink uniforms. <laughs> Another school where we have uh, a library, and uh, one of our teacher librarians. Um, our teacher librarians uh, don't, they're not usually, there's it would be very, very rare for one of our libraries to have an actual a librarian that was just trained as a librarian. They are teachers who are also teaching full loads, and we train them uh, with special classes in simple library management. And then they teach all the rest of the teachers in their school how to do the checkup procedures and those kinds of things. This is one of our libraries, and inside this is what it looked like. Uh, and these are the teacher librarians. And they're holding a picture of the kids that sent them that library. Who do we think this is? Any ideas? Ernest. Principal. <laughs> Not Ernest. Principal. Oh, Ernest, I love it. Principal. I like that idea. I like that idea. This is the chief of the village. Now, all tribes there have chiefs. And the chief acts as sort of like a judge. If you were having a little village dispute, like with your neighbor, you would go to the chief of the village and say, I did this and he did that, and what do you think? chief asks questions and they decide. 
Um, and most of the chiefs, they're, uh, they're on the library committees <laughs> for our libraries. Um, and they're very supportive. Go ahead. Uh, I, this chief had just agreed to provide the artifacts, the traditional artifacts that are going to go in the culture corner for the library. And I'll tell you about those in a minute. But he and I, we saw that. Loved him. <laughs> so I thought you might like to see a few libraries in a few of the countries. And you can imagine River Trail might have done any of these. Go ahead. This is one I saw later that day in Ghana. Uh, in Botswana, the, all the libraries look a little different in every country, and every village has their own way of decorating them. They all create their own policy for their own libraries, because the libraries aren't owned by us. They're owned by the local village or the school. Um, about 95% of our libraries are in schools, and then the villages, the villagers that surround them can come and visit the library and check out what's there. Swaziland, Lesotho, where we started. And uh, there are a few things that are different about our libraries than their libraries. First of all, any guesses as to how many books are in this room? 10,000, 12,000, 5,000, There's 20,000 books here. And our libraries are how many books? 1,000. 1,000. So a lot of these uh, libraries are not close to roads. So the kids need to go to the nearest road and they bring back the books on their head or in a wheelbarrow or sometimes on a horse or if, in a little truck if that's possible. We don't use the Dewey Decimal System in our libraries. It's too complicated. I find it complicated here. Um, we use something called color coding so that every subject area gets a different color and we put that dot of color on the books and that's how kids uh, find the books and know where to go back to. We discovered classroom libraries with a couple of books in each, a couple shelves in each classroom work incredibly well. We discovered this in Lesotho when a Peace Corps volunteer said, I want to apply for a library project for my school, but we don't have an extra room. The fourth and fifth graders are already using the chicken coop as their classroom. So I said, sure, let's try it. And we discovered that they are incredibly efficient because then the kids can go and get books immediately after they have copied down whatever the teacher put on the uh, blackboard. Here's another classroom library. Here's another one made with boxes that they scavenge. And here's another classroom library. We also, in our African libraries, if they have books that are written in their native language, then they have a native language section of the library. And you'll find those in uh, Botswana, where they speak Setswana. They do have native language sections in the library. This is one of those culture quarters I was telling you about. They build a little low wall. Uh, to, to look like their Ronda balls, their houses, and they um, put in all of the cultural artifacts from their um, their weapons, their clothing, their food, um, all kinds of things. Um, because a lot of them are losing their culture very quickly, their traditional culture. And this is a way that they can learn about their past in the place that is the most advanced technologically at their school. What is that? most advanced technologically place? The library. the library, with books that connect them to the outside world. Because it's only in the library that they can learn about things that the other people in their village don't know about. Okay. Here's a culture corner in, in uh, Swaziland. These culture corners have spread throughout all of our systems. Uh, this is an HIV AIDS section. We send 27 children's readers um, to uh, Africa and all the areas where they have a high incidence of HIV infection because getting the right information is critical. If you were, if your mother had HIV, was HIV infected, the first thing you would do, what would you want to do? Like, what would you want to do? Learn about it. Learn about it. Yeah, you'd want to learn about it. Well, there is no place mostly to learn about it. In fact, you would be advised by everyone that found out to not tell anybody about it. Because 
they believe a lot of times that you can get HIV infected just by being near somebody or touching somebody that is related to somebody. They don't know how it passes. That's the bottom line. And so they know that it's deathly. And so they don't talk about it. And there's huge level layers of secrecy around it. So being able to get correct information is very, very important. They love baby board books. Uh, they put them in play, they put them in this area called the snack corner, and they encourage all their students to have a snack before they get their main choice. Here's a teacher librarian. Go ahead. They do have rules, just like here. Uh, do you have this rule? If you steal or tear the books, you will pay. <laughs> sort of like you. I'm sure you have something. Like that, yeah. <laughs> These, I want to tell you a little bit about um, some of the book drives in the U.S. because they're done by companies, uh, book clubs, uh, schools, youth groups, 4-H groups, bar and mitzvahs, churches, individuals, senior citizens, you name it, they've done book drives. So these three little girls called me and said they wanted to do a book drive. They're nine years old. And they said, but we don't want our parents to have anything to do with it. No adults. I said, okay. So we met. And uh, they wouldn't even let their mom in the room. They had these legal-sized pads of paper with two, two pages with questions written, single space for me. And they took copious notes while I was telling them this and that. And they, together, collected over 8,000 books and started four libraries in Botswana and raised the money themselves. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah let's hear for them. <laughs> These are four first graders at a school in California that were part of a class of 20 children. Uh, they, about 15 of the children were immigrants from poor countries, so they really knew how important books were and what they didn't have. And they decided, uh, well, they, actually, their teacher, who was Japanese, on Friday said, now we've collected our 1,000 books, and it's time for us to raise our money to ship them. Monday morning, one of these kids walked in with a Ziploc bag full of enough coins and bills to send their library. They had gone door to door over the weekend, knocking on their neighbors and saying, did you know kids in Africa don't have how many books? We're going to do something about that. My class is doing something about that. We're starting a library. Would you help us? And those three things are very important. First, they said what the problem was. No books. Second, what are we going to do about it? Start a library. Third, we need your help. Would you help us? If we could all remember those three things when we were trying to get anything done in life, it would help a lot. So these are first graders. And that was one first grader. Do you guys think, do, do any of you have books at home? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do any of you think that you might want to donate some of your books to these kids in Africa that don't have books? Let me see your hand if you do. Well, these are some of your predecessors. Do you recognize this room? Okay. Yeah, these are some of the people who went before you at River Trail. Uh, since 2008, there's been a lot of activity at River Trail to start these libraries. Go ahead. And this is another very special book drive. This is another special. When I tell stories, River Trail is one of them. Okay, go ahead. These are the libraries that River Trail started in 2008 in Botswana. Award. She came to California, a national award on behalf of River Trail Middle School because you were so awesome. I don't know where that award is, but maybe Mary could dig it up and dig it out. Um, yeah, she's right up here. I don't know. Love her. You guys. <laughs> did not rest on her laurels in 2010. Ten more schools in Swaziland and Malawi. <laughs> Four more schools in Swaziland.
Swaziland. And I was, I think, with an African Library Project club, which I think you got going again this year. Yeah! <laughs> boxes of books, 26,554 books were set from 2008 to 2012. We started 27 libraries. You got the Compassion and Action Award. That is the second highest number of libraries of any book drive in the United States of America. And it's the highest of any middle school in the U.S. <laughs> Last year, and you guys weren't here, so I mean, you, you haven't done it at all, right? No. It's time to make your mark. <laughs> <laughs> it is time for you to prove yourself. Let's do this. How many of you, if you are interested and willing to help by donating books or working in the African Library Project Club or fundraising for money, I would like you to stand up. Stand up. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to finish by telling you a few stories uh, of how these books actually are changing lives. Some individual personal stories. This is Kanalela Moana, this girl right here in the front. And she was a teenager in uh, Lesotho, and I happened to know her, her teacher was a Peace Corps volunteer, and her teacher told me that Kanalela was a really smart girl, but that she didn't apply herself at all. And she just didn't try. Teachers, you ever seen a kid like that? <laughs> she didn't try. And she read, uh, a, we put a library in her school, and uh, she read a Sweet Valley High book. Maybe you know what those are? No. They're kind of ancient mm -hmm. now. But they're kind of, uh, it's nothing I would ever recommend, honestly. But she read a book about a girl who really wanted to go to college, but had all these challenges to overcome. And after she read that, she decided she wanted to go to college. And she shot up to the top of her class. And now she is at university. And that was because of a sweet bed. <laughs> wow. <laughs> this boy read a better choice. He read S.E. Hinton's The Outsiders. Do you, you know that book? You know that book? Okay. It is a book about gang warfare, right, in the United States. Well, he read this book, and you'd think, what does that have to do with Lesotho? They do not have games like that. But he had been bullied by his cousin all of his life, who was always beating him up. But after he read this, he thought, you know, I, you know like, I'm not going through the rest of my life like this. So he got up the courage to talk to his cousin about how he had bullied him. And now they're like really good friends. And that was because of a book. Catalelo, I just, he's my favorite story and our most current, current, current story. Um, this is him when he's about 10 years old and he was unpacking the books for the African Library Project. He was the very first patron of a book, of a, of a library in New Zan. Zan. <laughs> it's a click language and I'm not very good at it. Um, you know, some languages in Africa have clicks as part of their talking. Anyway. <laughs> Um, and this is, a, this is a, so he was a uh, San Bushman, and the San are a hunter-gatherer nomadic tribal group uh, that were in Botswana in the desert area, and they discovered where the San Bushmen lived that there were diamonds in that area. So the government built a reservation and moved all the San Bushmen into it, a lot like the U.S. government did with Native Americans in this country a couple hundred years ago. And uh, so there he was really ostracized. Um, the other people would say, you know, they'd say, go back to the bush. You know, like, you know, you little bush monkey. they call him all kinds of names. But he didn't, he said, that made him tougher. Like, if you've ever been bullied, like, I want you to turn whatever that is and have it make you tougher. Um, he decided I'm going to show him. Anyway, he learned to read, and he read every book in the library. And he became the very first San Bushman uh, to ever graduate from high school because of the library. He became the top student of his entire high school. Yes. Then he won an award and was honored by the president of 
Botswana and was awarded a full scholarship to any university in the world that he wanted to go to. Wow. And he's now looking at Stanford, which is 10 <laughs> minutes from where I live, and I hope he goes, as the place that if he, anywhere he can get in, they're going to pay for it. So, like, it's awesome. It's awesome. That's, that's, the, that's how you're changing lives, by doing what you're doing. So, I'm really glad you guys want to make a difference. I know that soon uh, there'll be an announcement about maybe the African Library Project Club. I think that's what Mary Peterson has got in mind to do. Are there any questions? Yes. They usually sit, they definitely uh, sit in different desks, and sometimes they'll sit on one side of the room and the other side of the room where the boys and girls will be separated, but uh, not more than that. Yeah. Yes? How oh, uh, many Eight or ten times, something like that. I did my junior year abroad in Sierra Leone. That's how I got started wow. when I was in college, and I traveled throughout all of Africa, then to 20 African countries, so I've gotten around the internet. So what you're going to do is you do a book drive here, and you'll collect them here. You'll sort them uh, according to the criteria. So you make sure you get the applications from Africa that we will send, so you'll know exactly which schools and what their needs are. And uh, you will box them up and ship them from here, and they'll go to a warehouse in New Orleans. And then all of the book drives from all over the country in southern Canada all ship their boxes there, and they get consolidated and put in those seat containers that you see. And we can get 30, 35 libraries in a small seat container and 65 in a large container that we should have. Website. website. Our website? Yeah. They, they yeah. Have a website. Yeah, we have a website. We have a website. Oh, wow. Are any of you on Facebook? Some of you? Facebook, African Library Project. Join us on Facebook. We post all kinds of interesting stories there. In fact, you might see something about Rift Trail Middle School if you check it out. Yeah. Yes? What kinds of books do they like to receive? Their favorite, favorite books are science books. Oh. Nonfiction is their favorite books. Um, yeah. I mean, that's where they begin. And I think the reason they love nonfiction books so much is because... They have never been exposed to the real world. Like, when they look up at the sky, they see little points of light, maybe not knowing that those are stars. You know? <laughs> it's amazing. And, like, think of all the animals that you've read about in Africa that you've never seen, but you think those are uber cool. Like, do you like gorillas? Elephants, I love them, and I never saw them before. I mean, I've seen them now. But yeah. Yes. Um, how did you get that deal to start? How did what? Well, it, I told this story of when I was out with my, and we were pony trekking around, or horse packing, you know, around Lesotho, and my son pulled out a book, and I asked the guide about libraries, and he said there was one. That's when I went, ding, 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 ding. And honestly, because I had gone been in Africa when I was in college, I went back to Africa thinking, I want to do something now. Like, when I was 20, I didn't know what to do. But now, I, I have more skills. I know more. A little bit. Yeah. Well, I started with uh, a website. And uh, I used to play jazz with a guy. And uh, he had just been laid off from a high-tech company. And I was telling him about this. He goes, well, I'll do a website for you if you want I said, I, got, I just went, whoa. I called him back and said, really? And that was kind of the beginning. And that was in 2005. And I started with a board. And the first year, I did seven libraries just by myself and working with schools. And then I said, no, I can't do that much by myself. How do I make this so that everybody can do it? All right, let's give her a very big